So in the last message, we went through the last of the plagues, uh, 10 plagues on Egypt, which plagues two witnesses also would be unleashing on the earth. They will strike the earth with these plagues. So we went through all the 10 plagues. And then I want to take a step back and see how and where these 10 plagues in the grand scheme of things. So we will go through the revelation chart and uh, where these plagues, we see some of them. And then also Matthew 24, the Olivet prophecy. I want to go through very high level today so that we also understand where it fits in where these plagues and the work of two witnesses uh, relate to the Olivet prophecy. Because Olivet prophecy is like a compass. It helps us to navigate through enormous data of prophecy. And, uh, and that is the goal. So Olivet prophecy actually spread, spreads across three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Luke gives very, very fascinating and interesting uh, information about the Olivet prophecy. So you have got close to 100 verses. If you take all the three uh, gospels for the Olivet prophecy, but tonight I will just go through Matthew version so that we begin to understand things a uh, better way. And also I want to share uh, with you uh, the type of study and type of learning we are doing in these Bible studies, in these prophecy insights. The study method I'm approaching is iterative study. Iterative study is you repetitively visit the same scriptures and you learn each time a little bit. With each iteration or iteration, you learn more. So some of the scriptures we visit again and again now and perhaps after a few months, we will come back to these things. Every time we come back to these things, we hope to gain more insight. Uh, this is a method of learning because the enormous complexity of data, it's very difficult to learn all in one go. So, so do not ever think that this is the last time we are visiting these scriptures. It is absolutely not. We would be doing again and again and again, as many times as necessary. And another thing is our interpretations. Our interpretations are our private, private to each person. You draw your conclusions and your interpretations. And my interpretations, I'm not going to force on anybody. I might, I might think what, what my interpretation is. This is how I am leaning towards. But interpretations should never be hardened. They should not be frozen. Because interpretations are our understanding. But the scriptures and data is what God is giving us. So the, what God is giving us, that does not change. So we go through different phases as we study this book. The initial phase is get familiar with the data. So that is what we are doing. While we are getting familiar, uh, the most important thing is thing that we are accomplishing or trying to accomplish is pattern recognition and pattern identification. We see the patterns. So uh, we identify the patterns and we get familiar with the scriptures. So that is the initial phase. After several months, we will come to a phase that we, we now we are more familiar and we understand patterns, several patterns we, we have already recognized and identified. Then we, we get more skillful at matching the patterns. We see a pattern here, we see a pattern there, we see a pattern some other place. And we also see the patterns in the world the news and what is happening in the world, both the mainstream media as well as the 
the other uh, channels, uh, especially owned and uh, given by Christians, several Christian channels, they give us the background information, what are the what are things are happening, especially those are helpful for the prop, prophetic insights and prophetic interpretations. And, and then we will go to the final phase of our study. We have, uh, so at that point in the final stages, whenever we reach, we would be more discussing on the conclusions the pattern matching and conclusions. And uh, we would be doing more of that because at that time, we already know basic scriptures. We might go back. We have to go back time and again, the scriptures, because that is what God gives us. So this is how we go progress towards the interpretations. And uh, we are all equals here. Sim simply because I'm presenting, I'm not a better person than you, or I'm not superior to you, and nor I'm above you. We are all brethren. We come here with mutual respect and uh, mutual love, God's love. And I believe everyone in this room has Holy Spirit, and uh, your Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit given to you, would guide you. And everyone is capable of doing the interpretation and drawing conclusions. And, uh, and I don't need to push or force you into a particular interpretation. I respect your privacy and I respect your interpretations. So nobody can parade with arrogance that my interpretation stands. You guys listen to me. I will straighten you up. I think that's a bad culture. And some of you might be coming from those cultures in the congregations, but we are not practicing that here. We are equals. We have given, take, respect. And uh, we have discussion session after each presentation. We should use that session to, to give feedback. If you think differently, present it with, with, with respect and uh, with uh, with reasoning not with arrogance not with putting down and the prophecy itself is subject to changes like as we gain more understanding our interpretations change and sometimes they get refined sometimes we we go in the first interpretations take us in one direction but later on, as we learn and we see more evidence from words God, uh, God's word, we change. Sometimes we, our interpretations get reversed. That's entirely possible. So don't worship your interpretations and hold them loose. But nevertheless, you must draw some conclusions as we go along, as, as God's Holy Spirit helps you and guides you and uh, as you get closer to God and maintain right relationship, right standing with him and your interpretations even be blessed by God, God will personally help you and give you vision and insight. So I, I trust and believe everybody is given Holy Spirit. Everybody is have their own mind and they can understand and they can interpret for themselves. So we should be aware of this, of this reality of Christian fellowship, and we should not never dictate terms. We have this freedom. I greatly, greatly admire and respect Don and uh, Don Wales and Peggy for providing this platform. Let us use this platform for the glory of God and our personal growth. And the freedom we have, let us also guard that. And uh, I will resist any bullying of putting a person's interpretation and trying to bully over others and push the interpretation. So I think you're all good. We shouldn't let the bullies bully here. <laughs> so having said that, let's uh, launch into the presentation. And uh, we start with semion. This is very important Greek word, which stands for figure of speech. 
it is types shadows metaphors semion and uh, it can be flag beacon it covers full range of representations and it has many figures of speech so semion translates in multiple ways and we are not talking about all the multiple ways but this is a high level this picture is intended to give you a, a, a basic understanding of semion so here the elephant kicks donkey out of this building elephant is not really elephant elephant is just a semion it is a representation of republican party and donkey is not really donkey it's a semion for rep democrats so the republicans kicking democrats out that means the defeated them a candidate in election and there is a building in behind it out of which the candidates are driven out or kicked out this is white house with a us flag on it and the whole thing appeared as a cartoon after the presidential election results were declared so we understand this building even though nothing is given about this building we understand this is white house this is how semion works so bible tells us in the book of revelation in the first chapter it says the whole book is semion god used semion to tell us so what you see is no longer physical literal interpretation but bunch of semions so with that understanding we are trying to figure out the semions we might make mistakes but as we revisit with iterative learning we go through verses again and again and again several times uh, our conclusions our understanding and interpretations of semion would get better so that's the hope we have so we will continue revelation 11 and there was given me a reed like unto a rod and the angel stood saying rise and measure the temple of god and the altar and them that worship therein there are two altars here in the in uh in the tabernacle and the temple let me give you So this altar, this altar, is altar of incense. This incense is a picture of prayers. So this altar of incense, incense goes to God as prayers. These are prayers of saints. So our prayers are also used to measure the temple. so those who are praying with crying and sighing perhaps for the abominations of the world and their own personal sins this also is a factor for measuring of the temple and also those who worship those who worship the father in spirit and in truth they would be included so the, those those are called true worshipers the true worshipers and the right kind of prayers that they are doing and they are part of the temple these are all measured and perhaps they are sealed and uh, this is how the temple proper the holy of holies and the holy place are sealed and measured but who those who fall outside they are not measured so they are not part of the temple yet but the court outside without the temple leave out and measure it not for it is given unto the gentiles ethnos and the holy city shall they tread under foot 42 months so the holy city is a is a euphemism for heavenly jerusalem spiritual jerusalem and in other words it is church church of the first born so the church of the first born is figuratively given to us as the temple or 
the altar and uh, worshipers. So this is all a language of the true church. And the true church, whichever do not fall in the true church, they fall here outside the temple. So they would persecute the true church. And we see that like for 42 months, it's a figurative period. It's a long period. And uh, that, that means it's a persecuted. True church is persecuted by false church as well as the world. And I will give unto my two witnesses. These are somehow closely related to this true church. Either the true church is witnessing or there are two individual witnesses which happen to be part of this temple and true church. Either way, your interpretation, we are good. So I will give unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy at 1200 three score, that is 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. So they are trodden down, they are persecuted for 42 months and yet they are witnessing and for 12, 60 days. So it, it appears to be of same period while they were under persecution, they're also taking the true gospel out. We see that in Matthew 24, these two things simultaneously happen. Church under persecution still does not stop, does not fail to witness for God. Perhaps two witnesses also do the same thing. And these are the two olive trees that takes us to Zechariah 4. And the two lampstands that takes us to Revelation 1, standing before God of the earth. So they are working before the God of the earth. And uh, if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So God is giving them special powers or authority to do this, these things. We went back, the fire proceeding out of their mouth. We went back to Jeremiah and Jeremiah did not open his mouth and literal fire came out and decimated his enemies. It did not happen. It is a figure of speech. It's a simian. God said, I will put my word in your mouth and make it fire. And I will make your enemies as like a dry grass stubble. And my word in your mouth goes and burns them, just like a fire would burn them. So Jeremiah prophesied under the instructions of God, and his message went out of his mouth. And then they did not, they did not get immediately burnt out. It took several months and years before the Babylonians came and decimated and destroyed them. So that's how it played. The whole script played in the Old Testament. And uh, we believe the same thing would happen. The two witnesses would prophesy under the instructions of God, but God would turn that message into fire and that will devour their enemies eventually that they would get destroyed. That is how we are understanding and interpreting the Simeon. Continuing Revelation 11, these have authority to shut heavens and it, that it rains not in the days of their prophecy. So we went to Elijah in the Old Testament. Exactly, he did same thing under the instructions of God. He prayed and three and a half years, it did not rain. There was a famine and there is food shortage. There are terrible things happen because of the famine. And, uh, and very similar thing two witnesses would be doing. So they would pray under the instructions of God and perhaps the spiritual rain and blessings would be stopped. So there's no more true gospel held back. That is one way it can, it can unfold. The other way is the physical way. And the, and the rain is a symbol of all the blessings, the physical blessings that pour out on the world. And those would be held for th figurative three and a half years. That's also possible. So we are not making hard conclusions. We are seeing the possibilities at this point. So that's Elijah. So we have uh, Elijah uh, and uh, 
we have also Moses. The Moses comes next and they have power to over the waters to turn them to blood. This is the first plague on Egypt, Moses. And of course, Aaron, Moses and Aaron, king and priest's office, they're also kind of two witnesses. And two witnesses, under the instruction of God, they spoke and the plagues came. So the first plague was turn water to blood and then to smite the earth with all plagues. We understood it's the rest of the nine plagues on Egypt. So we went through nine plagues on Egypt and we learned few things and enormous data was given to us. And as often as they will, or as often as they are instructed by God, they will prophesy and release these plagues on the earth. They will strike the earth or smite the earth with these plagues. So we'll continue a few more verses. And when they shall have finished their testimony, that means their testimony is finished. They're done. And God tells that your testimony is done. And then the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, Abusas, shall make war against them. So the testimony is finished first. And the beast rises out of the bottomless pit and shall make war against them. So there is a period where the beast is fighting them and they are fighting against beast. So there is a period of war. And finally, the beast shall overcome them. So beast shall overcome them and kill them. So kill them. So before they are killed, there was a war. Before they, after they, there was war, they were overcome. Their power is shattered. And before that war, and before that beast ascends from bottomless pit, before that, they finish their testimony. So this is the sequence we see. We see similar sequence in Matthew 24, also as well as in Revelation. And we will continue a few more verses. And once they are killed, their dead bodies shall lie in the street, one street of that great city, one city and one street, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. So there are two cities clubbed into one city. These are spiritual cities where also our Lord was crucified. So we see the pattern of two witnesses' death is very similar to the pattern of Yeshua, Jesus Christ's death. So we see very similar parallels. And that's why these cities are brought together and the cities have one street where their bodies would lay, where their Lord was also crucified. So we will explore these possibilities. And they, of the people, kindreds, Tongues, nations, this is all range of countries and kingdoms, dictatorships, all these things are covered and shall see their dead bodies three days and half, three and a half days. So you have this three and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put, put in graves. So there is no burial. Burial is an honorable disposing of the dead bodies, but there is no burial. They were kept open. It's a shame. It's a figure of speech. In ancient times, somebody not buried and their bodies are not buried. They're put to open shame. Some of the worst criminals, their bodies were never buried. They were thrown open for the birds and beasts. That's a disgrace. And continuing Revelation 11, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts to one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on earth. So the two witnesses were a nuisance to the people of the world. So they were pricking their conscience. They're tormenting by their righteousness and by their righteous witnessing that they did, either because of message or because of example. Their witness was bothering them it is tormenting their souls. Now the two witnesses are gone. They are rejoicing. They are making merry. 
And after three days and half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. So they were brought back to life and they're standing on their feet. Wow, the two witnesses were resurrected. And then, and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. So this is largely understood as first resurrection where the church gets resurrected and the two witnesses get resurrected and all the saints from the Old Testament times that were that slept, that were in Christ, they will also be risen first and we would be caught up as well as two witnesses would be caught up. Boom, the first resurrection, their ascension happens. And at the same hour, there was a great earthquake. See the earthquake. You have several earthquakes in plural, but there is one mega earthquake at the end of the age. And the 10th part of the city fell and, the, and in the earthquake were slain men of 7,000 and the remnant affrighted and gave glory to God of heaven. So this completes the uh, Revelation 11 uh, up to 13th verse. We will not be doing, doing all these things. But I want to take a step back and go through Matthew 24 and see if we can make sense of what we have studied about two witnesses so far. We have covered lots of turf, especially the 10 plagues on Egypt. We will review 10 plagues briefly and go to Matthew 24. So these are the plagues. First is turn water to blood and second is frogs. Third, gnats, and fourth, flies, and fifth, moraine, understood as pestilence. And then we have boils, and Revelation uses another word called source. They're pretty much conceptually the same. And you have hail, and locusts, and darkness, and finally, death of firstborn. So these are the plagues. This is a difficult concept, death of firstborn. We don't see that in Matthew 24. We don't see that in Revelation also, so there, is, there should be a conceptual link. But most of them we see. We see in Revelation. We also see in Matthew 24, Olivet prophecy. That's why somehow we should get, get familiar with the different portions of the word of God where these things happen so that we are go, growing in a balanced way of the understanding of prophecy. So this is diag diagrammatic representation of the plagues, 10 plagues, so which the, which the two witnesses would be striking the earth with these plagues. So let's see the revelation chart we have. So here we see the first plague in the second and third golden bows first. And then I don't see second, third, fourth plagues straight across. We also see sixth plague here and sixth plague here and I see seventh here and eighth here and ninth and uh, tenth is that the first one we don't have direct occurrence. What do you observe here? I observe here they are not in the same order as ten plagues on Egypt in Exodus. They are kind of juggled. They are like mixed up, their order got mixed up. So you have this huge challenge of putting things in order. It's always a challenge. So we have we are studying these, these plagues independently one by one, but we have to make a sense out of the order in which they appear. They might have, there might be an order, there may not be an order. So when we are ready, we will fully understand but at this time, we are still exploring and getting familiar with this massive data. So we have the locusts, we have plagues, we have famines, we have pestilences, we have frogs, we have darkness and pain, we have, uh, we have Armageddon, and uh, we also have sun, moon, stars, we have earthquake, one big earthquake. 
we also see that in revelation 11 when the two witnesses are finished and after they were killed and they were resurrected and they ascended then simultaneously there is a mega earthquake that's that that kills one tenth of the city so that earthquake kind of appears here as a single earthquake but in Matthew 24, Olivet Prophecy, we also see several earthquakes, but he doesn't mention one mega earthquake. So somehow we have to harmonize these things eventually. That's our goal. And we see the one fourth of the killed, people killed. So there is a famine. We see famine here. Uh, we also see in Olivet Prophecy and lots of killings we have uh, in Olivet Prophecy. But Olivet prophecy is answer to the question of disciples. So the disciples are considered true church. So the reply, the Olivet prophecy is given primarily from the church point of view, from two, true church point of view, how you are challenged when these mega events unfold. So what are the dangers for you as a true church, you and me, for us, what are, what are the true challenges when these mega plagues, mega events in a global scale unfold? So that's where the Matthew 24 comes to us. So it's again, as I mentioned before, it's a voluminous, massive data. But right now, today, I'm just going through Matthew version. So let's go through that. Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is given directly by Christ. And Christ, when he gives certain information that has more importance, and also Christ has a key. He has a key of understanding. Uh, this is scriptural. And also, I personally have noticed there are several prophecies, several teachings that start from Genesis and from different books of Old Testament, they keep on developing as we progress in the Bible. They come to full fruition and we don't quite understand what they are. And Christ makes one statement. It just opens the whole meaning of what these teachings are. He almost like a key and with this key, he unlocks the whole mystery of these teachings. And I also see these teachings continue into book of Revelation. And we see more mysteries, more teachings, more intriguing things were given in, 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 the, in the book of Revelation. Those things also stay some under the cloud, under the darkness, uh, difficult to understand. But when I come back here to Christ's teachings, he seemed to have some key that unlocks both in the past as well as in the future. No wonder scripture says he has that key of understanding, key of knowledge. So here Olivet prophecy unlocks some of these mysteries. That's why I want to come here. And also he gives the order in an orderly way how the events would go. So here he, he, he replies that this happens first, then something else, then something else, and then this thing, then that thing. So he narrates the whole prophecy and puts that in an order. And most Bible teachers and students follow that order. And I am also among them. I believe this is the right order. Other places we see things mixed up the order is mixed up, even in the Old Testament prophecies, visions of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, they also tend to get mixed up. But this is where we have a compass. So this is the compass, Olivet prophecy. So this helps us to put things in order. And every sentence he talks, he, he spoke, is a kind of key, figurative key that unlocks. So keep that in mind. And uh, key of knowledge, Matthew 16, verses 17 to 19. And Jesus answered and said unto, said unto him, this is to Peter, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, 
for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. So here Peter confesses, you are the son of living God. You are the Christ. Where can we go? And Christ tells him, you haven't figured this out on your own. My Father in heaven has given this information to you. So God has to give some information to us. Then only we begin to understand. This is the underlying teaching. And then verse 18, I say, and I say also unto you, Peter, thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee keys, multiple keys, not just one key, multiple keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So this key is of the kingdom that Christ gives us, gives to us. We don't manufacture the keys and we don't have ability to uh, make keys on our own. We have to be given so we can pray and request and ask for these keys. So these keys, one of them is key of knowledge. We'll see that. Luke 11, verse 52, Woe unto you, lawyers, for ye have taken, taken away the key of knowledge, and ye enter not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, ye hindered. So here is the key of knowledge Christ giving, and these Pharisees, lawyers, like our some of the pastors and teachers and leaders of the churches typically do, they block that key of knowledge from Christ. They themselves do not enter in, but the second sin is, more grievous sin is, they prevent others from getting this key of knowledge. This is the worst form of sin. And he has already pronounced a woe to them. Yourself, you do not come to the teachings of Christ, the key of knowledge, but you prevent others by arm twisting, twisting their arms, then he is pronouncing woe unto you. This is a dangerous state. So, however, we have a key of knowledge that Christ gives us. So, with this key, we try to unlock. We find several keys in Matthew 24, Olivet Prophecy. This is a very rich prophecy. This has close to 100 verses if you put all the three Gospels together. But we are just doing 33 zero verses today. And uh, initially, when I was 22, 23, when I was fresh kid in the worldwide, I was told that they are all literal and physical. And I went through each of these verses as a literally, and I thought there is a literal thing. There could be a possibility of literality. And possibly this script unfolds literally, but more importantly, over the years, over the decades, I begin to see a rich Simeon, a very, very, very rich Simeon, just unlocks itself into a huge body of teachings to these verses. It, it takes like so much, like if we begin the Olivet prophecy, it, it will take much more presentations than the two witnesses. It's a mega prophecy. So much information is packed, jam-packed and compressed in the terms of, in, 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 in the style of Semyon, in these rich verses of Olivet prophecy. So we have more to learn, more to unpack, but let's see at the high level, uh, try to reconcile and harmonize the what we have learned for two witnesses so far. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. This is physical temple, Heron, not the spiritual temple, Naas. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Actually, the other two gospels tell us that they are glorifying this physical temple, showing how great these walls are, how adorned they are. So they're kind of bragging and showing Jesus uh, about this temple, this physical temple. 
and then Jesus said unto them, See ye need, see ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Hmm. He corrects and rebukes the disciples. Don't focus on this physical temple. This is going to be dismantled. And focus on spiritual temple. Which temple are ye? Ye are the spiritual temple. And nevertheless, the physical temple always stood as a semion for the spiritual temple. What happens to the physical temple also happens to this to the spiritual temple that is us. If we permit one stone to be over the other stone, that is, in other words, hierarchy is going to be dismantled. We are all equals. All the stones have to be fit, fit together with one authority, that is Jesus Christ, Yeshua. You shouldn't have any hierarchy. That's what I see it. And uh, he says one stone shall not stand upon another, that shall not be thrown down. This is physically, literally fulfilled in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed and they digged out stones because some of the gold that melted because they put this temple in fire, that gold melted and the liquid gold uh, was seeping through the cracks and the openings between the stones and went into the ground. So in order to extract that gold, they had to take out every stone. So there was one not one stone standing upon another. It's a magnificent fulfillment of this physical prophecy in 70 AD. But there is more packed in this in Simeon way. That I think yet to be fulfilled or it is in progress. It is in progress now. The spiritual temple also the stones, we are called living stones of that spiritual temple that he is building. Even that temple, one stone will not stand upon another stone. Continuing, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, that's why it's called Olivet Prophecy, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? The world is not cosmos here, aeon, end of the age. So they ask three questions. When will this physical temple be destroyed? One stone will not be upon. And sign of thy coming. What is the sign of thy coming and the end of aeon? So three questions. He answers three questions. So the Olivet prophecy is a response to the three questions. Keep it in mind. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. So when you come to prophecy, the first and foremost thing is deceiving, deception. They will mislead you. So don't believe anybody. Don't let any man deceive you. That includes all your teachers, that is includes me, and all your pastors, past, present, and future. You should not let them deceive you. How can you do that? How, how can you prevent me from deceiving you? Only way is to check the scriptures and make sure what I'm teaching is in line with the word of God, both in letter as well as spirit. That's the only way. You should get familiar with the word of God so much so that you can easily detect if somebody is going off the track. And deception is the most dangerous thing that can happen to you and me in the end times, especially interpreting his prophecies. And that will also affect our salvation. The deception would cause you to move away from truth. The truth is central thing. You should retain the truth in you and you should retain the love of truth. These are the two challenges for Christians in the end times, as we approach end times, the truth and love of truth. Yeah, you should be living for truth and also witnessing for truth. That is the challenge. The opposite is the enemy camp, the demons and the Satan. They take individuals into their hold and those would infiltrate into our churches 
and those would deceive us. Deception is a big, big attack and he is warning everybody, including the elect. Don't think that I have, I am elect, I, am, I have Holy Spirit, but I don't see anywhere in the scriptures having Holy Spirit will protect you from deception automatically. Even if you are sealed doesn't mean you are automatically protected from deception. It is something you should expect and something you should be watching and guarding the truth. Truth. Truth is Jesus Christ, Yeshua. Truth is his teachings. I am the way, the truth and life. You have to protect all his teachings. That is truth. And you should be living them. There will be temptation. There will be pull. There will be persecution to move you away from the source of truth that is Son of God and the truth itself or love of the truth, the love, the agape that is compromised. So there will be enormous pressure on you and me going forward when these events come, forcing us to compromise. First, we compromise internally in our hearts and minds, and then we compromise externally, outwardly. So it all begins with a man. Take heed that no man deceives you. This is first instruction. Before even going into details, he tells you that he repeats again and again and again throughout this prophecy. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, that is, Jesus is Christ, Yeshua is Christ, they say, and shall deceive many, yet they deceive. So the first wave of deception is they identify Son of God with the Son of God of Bible. The identity is okay, but yet they deceive many. That's how they deceive doing different teachings. They say the same thing as he is Christ, but teachings they mess up. People are so beguiled because they never really took time to study his teachings. They assume that they know the teachings and somebody comes and deceives you and you believe them and then you lose your salvation. At least that's where he is going. And he says, many will come. There are many shall come in my saying. And how many people do, do they receive in the churches? And many they will deceive. So majority is going to be deceived according to him. We don't want to be in that majority. We don't want, we want to be in the minority that will not be deceived. So how much more responsibility is put, in, put on our shoulders? And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. There are real wars or rumors of wars. And see that ye not be troubled. Don't be anxious mind. These things are happening. For all these things must come to pass but the end is not yet. So we see the wars and bloodshed and some of the bloody wars and some wars are chemical, biological, nuclear, and we see radiation, we see like chemicals poured out. You have all kinds of uh, devastation, all kinds of confusion and all kinds of un lack of peace. The peace is taken away. We are subjected to intense mental, spiritual, physical anguish as these things are unleashed. So we should be ready so that we do not lose our faith. We stand firm and be prepared. For the nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will shall be famines. So we see the famines, the plagues on Egypt and the water turned to blood. There is a food shot, there is a water shortage. And when the locusts come, or when Elijah prays and there is no rain for three and a half years, we saw the pestilences and the famines. And these famines would cause enormous shortage of food. And there will be severe, severe consequences. We saw that when the food shortage happens, both in physical layer as well as spiritual layer, where the truth is stopped 
there is a famine of hearing of words of God. So we see here some of the plagues on Egypt, both famine and pestilence are parts of the part of the plagues that are unleashed on Egypt, as well as by two witnesses. And we also see them in Revelation. And then the earthquakes, we also see on the, in the Revelation and as well as uh, Revelation 11, the two witnesses in diverse places, there are multiple places, and these are beginning of sorrows. So he's walking us through the escalation, the more intens intensification. And the beginning, there is a phase called sorrows. So perhaps this looks like in our chart, Revelation chart, initially a third of the people are affected. So it's a mild one that goes on first. It seems to be like that. It's the beginning of sorrows. You see some effects, but later on you see full blown, even the deceptions. Initially they say Jesus is the Christ and this deceived money. But later on you see a different sophistication of uh, deception. They no longer say Jesus is the Christ. This They might completely unpack <laughs> different Christ. You see different Christs and different Gospels. So it's, it's more intense. So intensity of deceptions and intensity of the plagues. We see two independent things intensifying that we, we see same thing in the Revelation. In, in trumpet judgments, we see only thirds are affected. When golden bowls are done, there's a totality. Everything, everybody is affected with full intensity. And then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So there's a persecution on church. You and me, we will be subjected to intense persecution and they shall kill us. We see the same thing happening to the two witnesses. This beast that ascends out of bottomless pit will make war against us and will overcome us and kill us. So perhaps this is the beginning of the beast versus us. So the spiritual beasts are after us and we are against them, holding on our faith holding on the truth and love of it. And yet we are witnessing in spite of all these difficulties. And when, when the two witnesses are killed, before that, the testimony is over. The preaching, teaching is over. So then we will be killed. And uh, verse 7, And then shall be many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. So this is what happens to the church who are on the border lines will betray one another and shall hate one another. What is this? What is this exactly happening spiritually? You are no longer loving your brother and sister equal to yourself. You are betraying and hating one another. So you are departing from agape love. This is the second great commandment and also the special commandment the extra commandment that Christ gave us, you should love one another even as I loved you. So there's a total departure from truth, the total departure from agape law. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. See the language, many, many false prophets, not one or two. They are actually majority. The true teachers are minority. And how many people would go after them? Many. Very few people will hold on to the teachings of Jesus Christ. So you are doing a great moving away from truth. This is also called apostasia in Greek and apostasy in Thessalonians. There is a big apostasy that must happen before the end. So this is apostasy happening. And and because the iniquity, this is a bad translation, anomia is the Greek word, which should be rightly translated as lawlessness. Because the lawlessness shall abound, the agape of many shall wax cold. The word 
core, wax core is a suko or psuko in Greek. The suko is an interesting nuance. It is snipping out the fire or flame within. The burning flame and the burning zeal that we have at the beginning of our Christian journey that is gone, that is snuffed out. There is no more that fire within us because of the enormous, abundant lawlessness around us, both in the cosmos, the world, as well as in the church. People have no regard for the loss of God, their lawlessness. Because of that, we would be affected. The fire within us can be extinguished. It is same like instructions to Laodicean church. You lost that fire. You are no longer hot. You lost that fire. And it's also same like first letter to the first church, Ephesus. You lost your first love. You lost your burning desire, that fire. Repent and start where you have fallen and do the first works and do the first love that is agape love. So this is the warnings that we are subjected to that but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So our challenge is stay focused on truth, stay focused on loving the brethren, stay focused on the commandments and teachings of Christ. Truth and love of truth, no matter what. Stay close to God. That's the only way you can make it make through this rampant deception and rampant, pers rampant persecution rampant mega events of the world, very stressful events, these unimaginably stressful events, global scale. And this gospel, this is the key, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Aikomene is the all inhabited, inhabited world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So if you take this word, Either the two witnesses or the whole church would still be teaching and there will be one final teaching that will go over the all the nations unto witness and that witness should be completed and then the end will come. The same thing we see in Revelation 11. Two witnesses would finish their testimony and the beast will come and declare war and overcomes them and kills them. The end comes. And then the resurrection. And the resurrection when it takes place before the coming of Christ. At the coming of Christ, he will send his angel, angels, four corners of the earth. They raise the people. That's the first resurrection. So we are moving into the end, end time. So the witnessing has to be completed first. Because after this phase, they no longer will be able to witness. They no longer will be able to openly teach the true gospel. So from this point, I see the church goes underground. The church goes underground. So the beast acquires the power and the, perhaps this beast takes control of the, all the world governments, I strongly believe, including US government. So it is a global scale. And when that, once that happens, you will be under active persecution and you will go underground and you will not be able to witness. You will be silenced. At that point, some people within your churches, within your congregations, will come and betray you and hand you over to the authorities. They give tips to secret police so that they can come and take you and put you in jail or kill you. This is what Christ is telling, telling us, not me. And when Ye therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Stand in the holy place. Whosoever reads, let him understand. Let them that which are in Judea flee to the mountains. So when there is a persecution, you flee. When there is an abomination, you flee. There are clear instructions to flee. Go underground, in other words. 
let him which is on the house top not come down to take anything out of his house and neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes you have to flee and woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days and but pray ye that your flight will not be in the winter nor on the sabbath day for then shall be great tribulation such as was never since the beginning of the world to this time no nor ever shall be so this is one big mega event that never happened in the history nor will it be in the future this is a signature statement we see this that the locust attack is one time event and many events on the egypt god told them this is one time event event even egyptians did not see it in the past nor will they ever see so many of the plagues but that we described uh, have same signature here one time occurrence and the beast that comes out ascends out of bottomless pit also does its dirtiest work of persecuting and killing the saints and the elect at this time and that is also one time event and after that after that resurrection we see resurrection and as many as get killed would get killed as many were sent to prison would sent to prison and as many are preserved are saved from this trouble would be saved and then there will be first resurrection second coming and first resurrection but the beast after doing its dirty work would be sent to perdition it will go into the lake of fire and we also see the day of the lord unleash after this great tribulation and except those days should be shortened there should no flesh be saved but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened so to preserve the elect god shortened those days so there is a shortening normally it would take many many years perhaps that is cut short supernaturally divine intervention and if any man shall say unto you lo here is christ or there believe it not what is he saying don't come out of your hiding you are underground they try to lure you saying that christ is here or christ is there don't come out stay in your den or in your place wherever you are hiding stay there don't believe them for there shall arise false christs and false prophets and shall grow shall show great signs they even use semion and the wonders tell us in so much that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect so the very elect god has protected you in your own hiding place you will be tempted to come out hmm. nobody is spared because this is so genuine the signs and great wonders so you are subjected to intense pressure to move away from truth or fall prey fall victim to these deceivers behold i have told you he is telling so many times he starts the whole narration let no man deceive you again he is telling behold i have told you beforehand don't get deceived don't let any man deceive you listen to me and me alone give heed to my teachings get familiar my to, with my teachings hold on to me and my teachings that's what he is saying wherefore if they shall say unto you behold he is in the desert go not forth behold he is in the secret chambers believe it not stay in your hiding this is for a different phase of the world's history where the church i think i believe goes into underground don't believe for as the lightning cometh how the second coming happens not in secret not in the desert for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west 
so shall also the coming of the Son of Man. So this lightning is a flash of light that starts from east and it travels across the west. So several teachers and interpreters interpreted this as a sun. The sun rises in the east and shines all the way to the west. Isn't it? So we see sun, S-O-N, comes also as S-U-N. So when a son of man comes, he comes first, they will see the signs in the heaven, in the sky. And he will be like a second sun. Some teachers would say a brilliant second sun would shine. And people will be amazed and nobody would miss. It is such a global mega event and celestial event. Nobody will be able to miss. <coughs> and that's how the second coming of son, son of God, son of man. Don't believe anybody. It is self, self-revelatory, self-evident. Everybody would see this sun. And that sun, when it appears, there will be terror in the people on the earth with all the unbelievers. They will be terrified over the second sun. And then the resurrection happens. And at that time, the two witnesses also will rise and they will also ascend because there will be only one first resurrection. And I believe they are part of first resurrection. And um, we see the mega events. Verse 28. This is an important verse, actually. When we unpack this prophecy, we will do this. For wheresoever, in fact, in other Gospels, they will ask, like, where would this happen, Lord? They will ask, where? Where? They are pointing a geographical location and time. Where would this happen? But he answers in a very fascinating way. Where the carcass, the dead body is, there will the eagles also gather. The word carcass is a dead body, but a specific dead body. This is a very, very, very fascinating, very, very, very interesting Greek word, patoma. Patoma is not a normal dead body. It's a type of dead body. The patoma is the same word used when John the Baptist's head was chopped out and head was taken out and the body was left. And his disciples came and took this patoma, his body, without head and buried it. So the, it is a headless body. Wherever that is, the eagles would gather. The eagles probably should be translated as vultures. Vultures would gather. This is a normal phenomenon. Wherever you have a carcass of animal or some, some big, large animal, the birds would come and flag, flock, right? Especially vultures. It's a horrendous scene. Sometimes the blood would be spilled over as they were uh, eating the carcass and the blood would be all over the face and head of these birds. And it was a very frightening and, and grotesque scene. But here the patoma is a headless body. It is hinting to a dead church. And the eagles and vultures are a metaphor, semion for demon spirits. Uh, I'm going too far with, with the ana analysis, but this is a great, great information packed in this. And immediately, verse 28, after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give, it, give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. We see this all the time in the plagues. We see it in the locusts. We see it several judgments. They all converge with the sun, moon, stars. The sun, moon, stars is a signature statement of the day of the Lord. The tribulation is on, on church, on the true church, and the day of the Lord is on the cosmos. Perhaps there is an overlap. We have to explore that. And here the sun, moon, stars signature is there, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. And continuing, verse 29, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. This, some teachers believe that there will be second sun in the heaven. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven 
with power and great glory. This is second coming. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of the trumpet and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. This is the first resurrection, his elect. That brings us to the conclusion of the presentation. This is like two witnesses lying in the street of this great city, spiritually Sodom and spiritually Egypt, where our Lord was also crucified previously. So we will take it up in the next presentation. We'll come to the conclusion of the message. We'll open the room for, for the further discussions. I'm assuming you, this is not the first time you are going through Matthew 24. I'm, I'm, I strongly believe all of you have gone through it several times, more than one time. And uh, assuming you are super familiar with Olivet prophecy. But do you see connections with the material we discussed for two witnesses so far? Any bells ring? Yes, Gail. Um, when you were uh, reading the, the gospel, and then there was this portion that said that when the two witnesses died, the people gave each other gifts. Right? Or this, there was this part that... Um, the people, they were first tormented, but when the two witnesses died, they gave the, these people gave each other gifts. Yes. Yes, that is the world would be celebrating their death. Yes. Um, I remember when it was 9-11 uh, and also there was another occasion that uh, Israel was greatly harmed, the Muslim community gave each other gifts. I don't know if you knew that, but that was like, oh, who would, this was something the Muslims did. They, they celebrated by giving each other gifts. And that re when you said that, uh, it reminded me again of that situation that I saw on YouTube. They were celebratory and giving each other gifts and candies and, and they were so happy. So I just want to give that comment on, on that verse or part of that verse. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Gail. Uh, I think some Muslims would consider Israel and uh, United States as their enemy. And whenever something bad happens to them, they will rejoice. And uh, I see your point of view. Uh, but this is very similar. But it, it is not talking about just Muslims. Everybody in the world, all the religions, all the, all the countries would rejoice where the true witnesses, two witnesses are killed. So we're talking about a different event, but there is similarity of pattern. Thank you. We'll now go to Caroline. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you, Tigger. Uh, uh, looking at Matthew 24, 15, uh, I saw that it referred to Daniel. Daniel the prophet. And that I like to reference back to references, and that is in Daniel 12. If you look in Daniel 12, God's last message to Daniel, starting with four. But that, Daniel 12 talks about the great tribulation, yeah. Daniel 12, which verse? 
Well, you can see throughout it. Uh, Daniel McNeil, there stood other two of them. He, this, this, is, this is what that refers to from Matthew, I think. Yeah, I think I think that Daniel 12 is 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 what Matthew 24 is referring to. Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which other place do you see? Well, I, I started with I started with the beginning of twelve and just read through it and thought, yes, that's that's what it was referred to when it the abomination yeah. of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's actually three places. Uh, abomination desolation is is uh, written in prophet Daniel. Three places. Uh -huh. Three places we see the same pattern. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. This is one of the places. And from that time, the daily sacrifice is the word added by translators. There's no sacrifice in original Hebrew. So the daily is, shall be taken away. And the abomination that makes desolate is set up. And there shall be 1,290 days. Yeah. So the daily has to be taken out. And in its place, an abomination has to be set up. And when that abomination is set up, that makes the things desolate. Mm -hmm. so there are three steps that, that Daniel gives us. And all the three places, we see the similar pattern. First daily has to be taken. That's a good uh, connection. Even yeah, Christ. well, this is where I found that if that wherever I find one thing of great interest, there's always another, it's always in another place. I always see it two or three times, if not more. Because it, it the truth proves itself. It's a, its own witness to the truth. Thank you, Jagor. You're welcome. Uh, I want to do this in great uh, in great detail, uh, Carolyn, uh, in future presentations. Uh, when I do that, I will fully address this: how the daily is taken away, and how the abomination is set up in its place and then that would bring in the desolation and Christ is asking us when you see that you flee if you are in Judea that's the time to flee so the daily the word daily is very fascinating word uh, that is used in temple a lot. The daily can be translated as continually or perpetually. So it's used heavily in, in temple language, in the temple sacrifices, daily sacrifices. And uh, it's not necessarily sacrifice. It's something more important. If you strip away sacrifice from Daniel in those three places where daily sacrifice is taken away there's no sacrifice if you take that away if daily is taken away as it is in hebrew it, it's a great uh, greatly opens up uh, it uh, itself uh, throws more light in the abomination desolation but uh, that's a, that's a great connection thank you Any other thoughts? Any other? Yes, Gaia. I I just I just want to clarify when I said that 
um, yes, it is. It happened that way. But um, considering I'm here in the Philippines and I'm uh, aware of the Muslim uh, idealism, they want to turn the whole world to become Muslim. So there is this um, constant awareness from our part, especially in Palawan, the southern part has Muslims in them, and they're planning to build a huge mosque. We, they don't have big mosque in Palawan, but they're planning to do so. So right now, the pastors are praying and already knowing their plan are counter um, doing some things that uh, are evangelistic in nature. So uh, also to, to let you know, the Philippines has the longest jihad and it has for the fundamentalists, it hasn't ended. Because the Philippines, some of the portions of the Philippines used to be all Muslim. In, uh, I think, I don't know when, but uh, even in the government now, they have the Muslim, uh, they go underground. I mean, they creep up to the government. To, I think it's the same in your country. They're creeping up in all sectors of society, in education, in, in finance, in uh, so many areas, uh, maybe similar to the Chinese way of doing it, that it's no longer just physical war, but economic and educational and everything else. So um, pertaining to, to this mindset that maybe I have more awareness, that it's creeping up and if the one world government uh, becomes the, the norm and one world religion, sorry, not just the government, but the religion itself, then there is already going to be persecution because we are not all inclusive, that there's just one God for everyone and uh, any religion is the same. So th that's what I'm again, uh, again um, trying to say of what um, expounding to what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Tigor. Yeah, you're welcome. Some of these beasts are global in nature. They span across multiple nations. And the beasts also come in different flavors. Some are political beasts and some are religious beasts. Some are economic and financial beasts. So if when, you, when they have religious favor, flavor, uh, these beasts would, uh, would force their ideas on others, right? That's when probably similar things would happen. And when they kill the two witnesses, people would celebrate. But after three and a half days, the two witnesses would stand on their feet and they will be shocked and terrorized. And when they ascend to heaven and their enemies beheld them, and they thought when they killed the two witnesses, they thought they're all done. And they won, they're, they won the battle. And they thought two witnesses lost. But in reality, two witnesses won because they died in, while witnessing. They died as martyrs. And they actually won the battle. They were faithful unto their death. And God resurrected them. This is very similar like Christ. Devil thought Christ lost it. But Christ gained it with a massive victory. For him and his people to resurrect them. And same thing has happening for the two witnesses. People world thought they lost, but they won. And actually the world lost the war, war, the battle, because 
immediately they are visited with this mega earthquake. So one time big occurrence of the earthquake, it shakes everything down. Whether, whether it is a physical earthquake that shatters the whole infrastructure, or there is a, some kind of spiritual semion earthquake that, that shakes the very foundations of this beast system. And that will topple the beast system. And it says how many 7,000 men died in that one instance of the earthquake. So there will be terrible judgments and the wrath of God and day of the Lord that will be unfolded on, on the whole world as a punishment. Yeah, good, good point, the beast system. Because it says the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, that will make war against the two witnesses. You're right. Any other insights, any other bells ring as we discussed Olivet prophecy? Tagore, uh, since you're bringing up the two witnesses, do you think the uh, this will also be the time of the resurrection? When, though, when the two witnesses are resurrected, do you think the rest of the, <clears throat> the shout of the archangel, you know, the shout of the archangel, the, that occurs around the same time and the rest of our, the dead in Christ rise and then the rest, those who are alive rise. Do you think that's around the same time as when the two witnesses rise? Uh, that's right. Uh, I believe that is the case. Uh, is it scarlet or yeah yeah scarlet sorry uh, yes i do believe uh, because uh, first corinthians 15 that you quoted uh, it's one time event the first resurrection there there would not be two first resurrections right logically speaking so the dead in christ shall rise first and those who are alive will cut up and uh, the two witnesses also should be logically and all happens in the twinkling of an eye. But in two witnesses case, it's very fascinating. It's a two stage resurrection. Probably it's a figurative. Uh, first, they will be resurrected. They, they stand on their feet. And then they were told from heaven, come up hither to, and then they rise. And this two-stage resurrection, two-stage, two steps, we can say in the first resurrection, uh, we also see that in uh, prophecy of the Valley of Dry Bones. I strongly believe that's also first resurrection. There are too many signatures to match. So there also we see the uh, Ezekiel 37. Uh, Ezekiel goes through this huge valley where all the dry bones are there. And uh, in spirit, he was made to walk, perhaps like a glide through the whole valley, like, uh, like a drone. So he's, he, he sees too many bones and too dry. And then the next step is uh, uh, God asks him, son of man, will these bones live? And he answers smartly, you know the Lord. And then, then God asks him to prophesy. You prophesy against these bones. Then he prophesies, and then bones come together, this clutter, and then they come together. And then he sees this sin, and the flesh comes on them. The sinews come, and the whole flesh and skin cover these bones. That means they have all the body parts, internal organs as well as external organs. They all came. And uh, they're almost like dead bodies at that time, but there is no, there is no life in them. They are just dead bodies. And then the prophet was asked to prophesy again now, not to these dead bodies, but to the winds, the wind, oh wind. So he prophesies and the four winds from four corners of the earth come and breathe into the nostrils of these men. And then they stand and a big, huge army stands on their feet, just like two witnesses. There's a second stage from bones to the men standing. 
and then the third stage is they they would be resurrected that's the first resurrection so we don't know how this first resurrection happens corinthians says it all happens in twinkling of an eye but people have argued for each person is a twinkling of an eye some people would be raised to the uh, raised to some bodily form so that people would so notice that you are raised and then you would cut up into heaven in the twinkling of an eye so that they see the evidence that so and so such a such a person is now alive i don't know all the details but i'm just throwing out the possibilities that could happen hope that helped you not to confuse but help that's the intention right thank you thank you tagore another quick question um in revelation 11 uh of course it's talking about measuring the temple and we believe the temple is the body the body of yeshua um how do you think we are measured i think that's a very good question uh we briefly addressed that in the earlier presentations uh there are three or four different teachings uh that address this uh, subject how we are measured measuring is judging when you are measured you are judged and one way we are all judged uh, by the teachings of uh, yeshua jesus christ that is the standard one standard for everybody ever born ever lived so that's one way to look at it second way is they are also sealed uh when john was told to measure they were sealed uh they were sealed in their righteous standing with god or right standing with god that is a second teaching how you maintain is very personal between you and god uh that is the second teaching and third teaching is they were also sealed in ezekiel prophecy where six men with axes would 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 start to slaughter the church and they were church and the whole israel in that context but here it is the church and the world they were slaughtered but before they are slaughter slaughter everybody uh, they were asked to stop and then the angel with an ink uh, he will come and mark on the foreheads of some people and then the six men with axe they were told not to touch those who were marked with this ink and who were those marked who were crying and sighing for the abominations of the world they are not participants of the abominations but they are also not uh, condoning the abominations but they are standing against them internally and externally and they were sighing and crying in prayer in lamentation and then god saw that as righteousness and asked them to be marked with this ink so they are spared so they are measured to be inside this temple uh there are few others uh there are multiple ways the measuring happens and uh, the people who are left outside in the court they are not measured so are they permanently left they would never going to be part of this temple uh, we don't know some commentaries some teachers think that they are not measured as of now that's the that's the stand they want to take perhaps their measuring might continue through this judgments through this mega events and perhaps they would be redeemed from their state back into the true church or back into the true temple uh that's how they are measured there's a potential for them to come back and uh going back to your verse revelation 11 there are three 
primary uh, uh, elements that were given to us. First is the temple that is Naas, the Holy of Holies. Second is the altar, which again comes back to prayers. We see that in Ezekiel, sighing and praying, sighing and crying for the abominations of the world. That's a metaphor for the whole qualitative prayers of the saints. That makes a big difference according to that. And also those who worship. And again, Christ gives us, gave us command to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Only that kind of worship is legal now under new covenant. Any other worship is illegal. And these people who are worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth, they are called true worshipers. So you have to be true worshiper and you should be crying and sighing and the qualitative prayers and you should be part of the Naas, that is the Holy of Holies. And Holy of Holies uh, Sanctum Sanctorium is uh, another mega subject. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant, that box is there on which the, uh, the pillar of cloud and uh, pillar of fire would position itself, which is presence of God on the Ark of the Covenant. That is called House of God. So you, as a temple of God, should be part of that house of God. So the presence of God should be placed above you. That is, you are now the box, that is Ark of the Covenant. And everything within the Ark of Covenant should figuratively represent you. And you are subject to the authority of Christ and his Father. Basically, you are yielding your members, your inward components to the authority and reigning of Christ. That is another way to look at how you are measured to be part of true church. It's more demanding. Your inward righteousness is super important. It's not something you show, but something you live inwardly. So three elements also I see. I covered a lot, sorry. A very complete answer. Thank you, Tagore. <laughs> that was a, a good, complete answer. Um, where there is a lot to cry and sigh about, right? And if anyone has trouble doing that, go watch The Sound of Freedom, and you'll be crying and sighing. But uh, just, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's true. Like, we are kind of made uh, callous sometimes to the murders. We routinely watch murder, so and so murdered, so and so murdered. We become callous. And scripture is warning us to becoming callous with the murders and abominations. And uh, we are supposed to close our ears hearing the blood. Some of these things are not popular in church, but scriptures are clear. Go ahead. Oh, I'm just going to, to say that a lot to sigh and cry about. We can, you know, read our, have our Bible in one hand, as somebody put it, and put in your newspaper in the other, and, and you're going to see the signs and the times and how close uh, we probably are getting because people are getting so aberrant, so uh, give, I, I can see him giving people, men over to um, a, 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 a what, what, what kind of mind is it? it a, um, there's a couple of words. Reprobate. A reprobate mind, an abased mind. We've got to be getting there uh, globally with, with mankind, some of the horrible things that are going on. And you were talking about the de, uh, deceit, and that's huge. We have to be discerning truth in this deceptive world. Uh, for 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 14, talks about false apostles, deceitful workers, angels of light, uh, great deception. Um, and of course, we have that globally through uh, media talking points, uh, compromised scientists and doctors and religious leaders. And we have doctrines of demons. We have empty philosophies and um, let's see, 1 Timothy 4.1 talks about the deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons, um, and so on and so forth. Well, 
So I think we've really got to get that armor on. We've got to put on that armor, Ephesians 6, I believe, and gird, gird our belts with truth, um, gospel of peace, shield of faith, helmet of salvation, and on and on. And uh, 2 Corinthians, we've got to examine ourselves and um, see where we're at and in all of this. And I'm thinking of one of those doctrines that's really deceitful is the rapture doctrine. Because uh, I've just been hearing this uh, from several sources. People are, are you know, it's, it can be any time now. We're going to be going, and we're going to avoid any of this, uh, the, any of the plagues, any of the, any of the tribulation, I think the, that will be gone. Christ is coming back, getting his um, his bride, uh, getting them out of here because they are not um, they're not for wrath. I think is one of the scriptures they 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 quote. We look at it as three and a half years of Satan's wrath, three and a half of God's wrath. I don't know if I don't know that. I guess I still stand in that area of understanding. I think we are going to, I mean, obviously there's going to be, there's going to be some persecution and Satan's going to wear down the saints. So how would you, uh, what would you say to someone who is ready to go, the rapture is occurring, going to, going to be any day now, and is there anything you think you could say to someone um to keep them from from losing their faith when this doesn't happen the way they think it will. Yeah, uh, I don't want to be too harsh for people who believe in rapture. Right. Listen to this message over the internet, but uh, rapture, rapture, pre tribulation, rapture is unscriptural. Uh, rap, re, tribulation with first occur, and then then the second coming comes. Uh, I don't see the pre-tribulational rapture that is false doctrine. And uh, that is one of the major false doctrines uh, people have bought in big numbers, uh, fulfilling perhaps that verse, many would come and de many deceivers would come and deceive many. We see this doctrine is bought for many, many, many Christians. You are a minority if you are not believing in rapture. And sometimes in some situations, you will be ridiculed for not believing rapture. And rapture gives you a passport uh, to get out of tribulation. There is no such thing as every, everybody has to go through some tribulation and some would go more into that depending on how much you are in bed with uh, Jezebel, that spiritual Jezebel. Those who are in bed with her, God said he will throw them into the great tribulation. If you are not in bed with her, perhaps there could be less, less heat that you will be subjected to, but almost everyone goes through the great tribulation. And to say that you will be raptured before the tribulation occurs is a, is a false doctrine. But there is a rapture, we call that resurrection, that happens after or at the time of second coming. So that is scriptural. So the timing of rapture is, uh, is, a, is a debated thing and uh, it could be unscriptural. And uh, that would uh, loosen your uh, vigilance, loosen your preparation to get up for, the, for this heavy persecution and tribulation. So you thought you will be resurrected. As you said, you will not be resurrected. Then you will figure out it's all false. Then you may lose your faith make a shipwreck of your faith because the false doctrine that you believe turns out to be false, but you might have the slippage and think that whole Bible is wrong. Whole Bible is right, but you are wrong because you listen to somebody, some man, let a man deceive you while Christ is warning you, let no man deceive you. So that's a major deception people have bought in. That's obvious major uh, 
rapture, pre-tribulation rapture as we call it. But I see there are some more equally dangerous uh, doctrines of demons. We will discuss them. I think they are equally fatal and take out your salvation. You will not be in the first resurrection. If you go some of, with some of them, they are more dangerous, perhaps more dangerous than rapture cult. I, I, I agree. I absolutely agree with that. That was just one that, that has been on my mind lately because I've been hearing so many people all excited about we're so close. We're so close. We're going to be taken out of here. We're not going to have to deal with all this. You know, no need to fear. And there is no need to fear. But uh, there's also no need to fear that they're, that we won't be taken up in a rapture. So, so thanks. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know, and they've got names for this. So we're not the only ones that disagree with the pre-trib group. And then there's the mid-trib and then the post-trib. I'm sure you're aware of all those beliefs. But anyway, I think Sandy's got her hand up. So I'll let her talk. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, let's go to Sandra. Hi, Sandra. How are you? I'm okay. I'm way back before this discussion into the first part that... Um, Scarlett was addressing, which is the uh, groups of people or groups that are changing the world and, you know, causing the things that we saw and cry for. And she was very thorough in addressing, you know, um, uh, political and all the different levels of that. But one I, I didn't hear her mention was the youth, which I see in a very strong way. Um, the youth are being so changed through the educational system, uh, through books and the beliefs of the teachers, that they know no other way except the way of this world, which is exact opposite of what we are like. Uh, you know, the, they become very selfish, and and then a lot of the things they partake in, and and to them it's just normal. They the the educational system is is easily gotten a hold of them. I I, I talked to one person who uh, was at one of the camps at one of the Church of Gods, and things they had to control. And I never thought of so many things that that the children can bring in amongst the God's children. Um, not saying that the ones that come in are not God's children, but but things they had to fight were, were vaping and tattoos and dress and hair color and all sorts of behaviors. And they did a hard work to control that. And they pretty much did, you know, but it, it could, the children are so many. And I, and I know so many that I know who grew up in the church who are not, uh, the same. The world has gotten hold of them. And, you know, I'm talking about before high school graduation. It's it's really sad out there. So I was going to include the educational system. That's all. That's a, that's a very, very good point that you raised. Uh, it was once a Pope told, like, you give me your children, I will get them what I want in one generation. I can exactly shape a country the way I want with one generation. You give me your children. It's kind of a thing that played out. And as you and, you and I know, that there is a systematic attack on our schools and our universities. The first prayer is taken out and God is ridiculed and God's way and Bible is despised and people, students, youngsters going from Christian homes, they come back as atheists. They have no respect for parents, no love for their family, no reverence, respect for anybody else. They're selfish and... Uh, you see a different person once they come back from universities back. They don't, if they ever come back, 
that's uh, that's one thing. There's a systematic attack, and uh, and there is some backlash from conservatives and uh, some political things. Like in Florida, they they're trying to address, but I believe you are at no point of return. Point of no return. Now we can try to restore something, but something bad happens that pushes further away to the, in, in the evil direction than in good direction. Uh, what I mean to say, probably we would never get back to that point where we can restore Christian prayer in schools. So we couldn't fully undo the damage that is already done. And we al already see the generation, the newer generation is so far different from us who are raised in a completely different culture. Uh, and uh, and their devil got most of our children, the next generation, which would be raised as atheists. And uh, so they are already deceived. You are, you are now a different generation. Uh, devil and these beasts find no resistance at all from them. 